Thank you for those uh, kind words. Um, first of all, I would stress I'm going to take you through for a, uh, on a highly idiosyncratic journey through bone infection. I would also stress that probably unlike most people who have spoken to you if you've attended here before, I am not a surgeon. You do not want me anywhere near one of your joints. <laughs> um, now, I'm an infectious diseases physician, and to put you out of your misery, that faint accent is indeed South African, tinged with a bit of time in New Zealand, well spotted in front row, a bit of time in New Zealand, and a little bit of time in the United States. Um, nevertheless, I've been here for a long time. I don't often talk to members of the public um, unless you count my teenage daughters as members of the public. Um, I'm rather hoping they will not, uh, I'm rather hoping this audience won't be as challenging as they sometimes can be. But they, they also always ask for money, which I'm sure is. Um, I thought I would, um, perhaps just by, by way of introduction to uh, bone infection, um, uh, talk a little bit about certainty, and I'm particularly taken by this uh, poem by uh, Glenn Calhoun from New Zealand, who said, when I am in doubt, I talk to surgeons. I know they will know what to do. They seem so sure. Once I talked to a surgeon, he said that when he is in doubt, he talks to priests, and priests will know what to do. Priests seem so sure. Once I talked to a priest, he said that when he is in doubt, he talks to God. God will know what to do. God seems so sure. Once I talked to God. He said that when he is in doubt, he thinks of me. He says, I will know what to do. I seem so sure. Now, the reason I put that up there really is, um, um, I think as a medic, is to say that actually, I'm often not sure what we should do for infection or what should be done for patients. And I think that sort of humility would, be, um, would stand a lot of doctors in good stead, be they physicians or surgeons. Now, I don't want you to read that slide, you can't. But I wanted to get it out of the way, which is I'm well aware that at least in name, uh, this evening's meeting I think has to do with the research network. And that is the list of completely impenetrable, so even if I expanded it, it would still be impenetrable. That is the list of the publications that we've managed to put out of the Bone Infection Unit in the last five years. So if you really want to see those papers, I can get them for you uh, in full print. But I thought I would start uh, in Bone Infection. I think the best way to start is with something topical and borrowing unashamedly from Have I Got News For You? I'm going to ask which is the odd one out. Here is a child with a rash. Here's another child with a rash. This is a Japanese um, poster from about 100 years ago exhorting people to go and get vaccinated. And there's a postage stamp with George Washington. Who's the odd one out and what on earth has it got to do with bone infection? Well, I'll tell you, I'll, uh, I, sorry, what was it? Washington. George Washington. What, does anyone know what famous disease George Washington had? Well, he had a disease which he ought to have died of, but he didn't. He had smallpox, and he survived it. And in fact, this little um, introductory um, slide that I'm showing you, um, and the reason I'm putting it up, I'll explain in a moment as well, is to point out that the range of bone infections has changed dramatically. In the time of smallpox, when George Washington had it, one of the manifestations of bone infection was in fact an inflammatory condition triggered by smallpox in the long bones, particularly the legs. With the disappearance of smallpox, that's of course a disease that none, is, none of us ever see before. But George Washington is the odd one out because he's the only one who ever actually had smallpox in that slide. The kid on the left has got cowpox. The kid in the middle has got one of the side effects of a smallpox vaccination. And this Japanese poster down at the bottom is urging people to get cowpox vaccination so they can't get smallpox. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to make my discipline as interesting as, as possible. Now, who's the lady on the left? <laughs> 
T-Rex. What's her first name? Sorry? Tyrannosaurus Rex? No, she really has a name. She's oh, called she? Sue. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's called Sue. She lives um, in, the, in the Field uh, Museum of Natural History in Chicago. And if you ever go to Chicago and you wander around this enormous animal, what you will see is that she, in fact, has a bone infection in her left foreleg. The bones are all distorted, mal-shapen, and have grown together abnormally. And that, the reason I put this slide up, is to illustrate that bone infection and its consequences are millions of years old. There's nothing unique about human beings get them, nor, nor is there anything modern about the disease. On the left-hand side, though, you can see an x-ray of a modern human being who's about to undergo the effects of bone infection on it. Now, I think it'll be pretty obvious, even from the back, that as you look at that x-ray I've got up there, you'll see that parts of the bone where that yellow arrow is start to be eaten away. And look at that. The bone, 50% of that bone has disappeared over the period of six weeks. So bone infection can be an enormously destructive process. In the case of the Sue, the, the dinosaur, she certainly didn't die of bone infection. She presumably acquired it as a result of trauma, and she would have died with it, but not because of it. Well, there's a, another stage in the evolution of um, this patient's bone infection in this unit. Um, now, I thought that, as I said, this is going to be a highly idiosyncratic tour through um, uh, the, something about bone infection. But I'm showing you two pictures over there. One is uh, a, a work of art by the artist Scott Hutchinson, who specifically has given me permission to reproduce this. And it's a, a, a picture of a very deformed and dismembered human being. And on the left-hand side, we have a patient uh, who's also given consent for the photograph to be shown uh, in the Nuffield Orthopaedic Center. Uh, who's demonstrating her dancing skills, having had her bone infection treated by Martin McNally and David Stubbs in her right lower leg. Now, the question that I always ask is, how is it possible to do to a human being successfully what has been done to the young lady on the left there? What has made orthopedics an acceptable thing to do to your fellow human being? Now, Really, there are three things that are, are required for orthopedic surgery to be an acceptable thing to do to a human being. And I'm just going to list them uh, up there for the sake of completeness. But to, to carry out orthopedics required the invention of anesthesia back in the middle of the 19th century. It required the development of antisepsis and Joseph Lister uh, was one of the first people to come up with that. And it required the development of x-rays. X-rays were necessary to work out what was wrong with the bone before you opened up the body. But equally, following the invention of x-rays, they started to inform litigation, because patients then could also see exactly what the surgeon had done after the operation. <laughs> there you go.